Welcome to The Baton, a John Williams musical journey. Join host Jeff Cummings as he takes you through the career of the illustrious film composer John Williams one film at a time. Starting with his debut as a film composer in 1959 through more than 100 films in 60 years. Our episode today listens to the music from Not With My Wife You Don't, made in 1966. Now, here's your host, Jeff Cummings. Hi, everybody. As always, I'm glad you're here with me for this episode of The Baton. Well, here it is. We have reached the final film of 1966 for John Williams, a very busy year for the composer with five films on his plate. Two westerns and three comedies, one of which produced a benchmark score. Four scores that showed some promise but didn't elevate the film much. And let's not forget that failed TV sitcom that lasted just five episodes. What I discovered through these five films is that John Williams didn't appear to view 1966 as a sprint, but rather a marathon journey through what I'm sure he wanted to be a career that lasted for a very long time. The product didn't fizzle as the year progressed, and what I heard indicated a rising enthusiasm for writing music for film. This would be a very important thing for John Williams because his contract with Review Studios was at an end and he was embarking on a full-time career as a freelance film composer in the second half of the 1960s. John Williams' final film for 1966 felt like more of a light drama than an out-and-out -out comedy, but it's officially billed as a comedy. And why would you describe a film called Not With My Wife You Don't anything but a comedy? The title alone screams comedy, but the execution of it is a bit unsure. We've got an established comedy actor as one of the leads, and another actor whose repertoire was very light on comedy. And the woman in between them is an Italian beauty that gets lots of soft lighting. I liked the pairing of Tony Curtis and George C. Scott as the two Air Force pilots fighting for the affections of the Italian beauty played by Verna Lisi. Curtis, who was best known for starring in Some Like It Hot in 1959, wrote in his biography that he didn't want to play the absent husband, but rather the playboy pilot that George C. Scott took on. For Scott, who would become very famous in four years as General Patton, this was a major change of pace playing a romantic and mostly comic role. He was well known for his villainous Oscar-nominated turn in The Hustler and, against his wishes, played a comedic role in Dr. Strangelove in 1961. I think I can see Scott working very hard to come off as a sort of sex symbol in Not With My Wife You Don't, but I think I saw an actor who was also uncomfortable in a few scenes as he poured on the romance. The problem in the end isn't the casting, but the screenplay. The names given credit for the screenplay were well known at the time. Melvin Frank was the writer behind such hits as White Christmas, and Larry Gelbart was a TV writer for Sid Caesar in the 1950s, and would create the classic TV sitcom M.A.S.H. in a few years. But the talents who put the words on the page couldn't create a cohesive story. The main problem is that it needed to stick with being either a slapstick romantic comedy or a serious drama about love and marriage. So here's a rundown of the plot with spoilers ahead. Tony Curtis plays Tom Ferris, who is married to an Italian woman named Julie. Tom is an assistant of sorts to Air Force generals, including one played by the future Archie Bunker, Carol O'Connor. Before he's set to go to Denmark on a speaking tour, Tom sees his old friend Tank, played by George C. Scott. The word is that Tank is off to Tom's house to see Tom's wife. That prompts a lengthy flashback where we see Tom meeting Julie after he's hospitalized after a bar fight in Korea, where Tom and Tank are stationed during the Korean War. Julie is a nurse in the U.S. hospital, and Tom falls in love immediately. Tom and Tank always fight over the same girl, and Tom tries to keep Tank from meeting Julie, but that doesn't last long. Since Tank is Tom's boss, Tank sends Tom to Japan for some recuperation and takes the time to woo Julie. A little later, Tank's plane goes down during a battle with the Koreans, and Tom tells Julie that Tank died, even though he survived and was being treated in the Philippines. 
Tom and Julie get married and are pretty happy for 14 years until that moment in the film when Tank returns into Tom's life. Tank is back to his old tricks, including sending Tom to the Canadian province of Labrador for a month while Tank tries to rekindle the flame between him and Julie. When Tom calls from Labrador and doesn't immediately say he misses Julie, she asks for a divorce. Tom comes home and fights Tank for Julie. And in the end, Tank realizes he isn't the marrying kind and gives his blessing to Tom and Julie, who end the movie having given birth to two children a few years later. John Williams keeps his score relatively low-keyed throughout the film. There is a bar fight that doesn't get original music from John Williams, and the climactic fight is mostly music-free. There are a couple of scenes that give John Williams the chance for some comedy writing, and it's very much subdued compared to what we heard in another military comedy, John Goldfar, Please Come Home. But what stood out for me most is the new collaboration John Williams had. The film features three original songs with music by John Williams and lyrics by Johnny Mercer. When 1966 came around, Mercer was one of the most honored people in Hollywood, having won four Academy Awards for songwriting. Two of them were with composer Henry Mancini, Moon River from Breakfast at Tiffany's, and the title song to the drama Days of Wine and Roses. Leslie Brickus and Williams had done moderately well with their songwriting collaboration in Penelope, the previous film before this one, but when it came time for someone to supply lyrics to three melodies Williams composed for Not With My Wife You Don't, Brickus was deep into finalizing the songs he wrote for the upcoming film Dr. Doolittle, which would be released in 1967. That meant Williams needed a lyricist who had some free time. And because Williams and Mancini were very good friends, I wonder if Mancini lent Mercer out to Williams for songwriting assistance on Not With My Wife You Don't. The resulting songs add nothing to the film's plot, which doesn't help make them memorable. Williams and Mercer would only collaborate once more after this, in 1973, for The Long Goodbye. So let's talk about those three songs. The first one we hear in the film is A Big Beautiful Ball, which has nothing really to do with what we're going to see throughout the film, but plays over the opening credits as a setup for the movie. If anything, it sets up the mood to be light and fun and pretty much uncomplicated. There is actually a song in the film called Not With My Wife You Don't, and it plays at a disco where Tank takes Julie while Tom is serving at a conference in Denmark. The lyrics don't really make too much sense, and Williams' melody comes straight out of the 60s pop playbook. Oh, oh, oh. Take my father, 
The final song is a love ballad of sorts called My Enamorada, which is a fancy way of saying My Lover. My feeling is that it was supposed to be the signature song of the film, but you don't really get to hear it as it plays during a reception when Tom and Julie are dancing. There's a lot of dialogue over the song in the film, but I'll play a bit for you here, dialogue free. Not much to the song. Mercer probably knew that it was going to be playing as background in a scene with dialogue, so he wasn't too inspired, I think, to make an emotional love song. But My Enamorada did get covered by Tony Bennett a few years later, and it became one of his hits. In four of his previous films, Williams was tasked with inserting the melodies from the songs of the film into his score. He gives us a small instrumental dose of Big Beautiful Ball, but his focus will be on My Enamorada later in the film as sort of a love theme. Right after the opening credits, we get right into the underscore with an animated sequence where a dinosaur is playing the violin. The dinosaur is called Jealousy, and he's really busy lately because men all over the world want what they can't have. His latest call of duty is to London, where Tom is living and where Tank is about to appear and set off the plot of the film. Here's some of the music that plays under that animated sequence. When Tom gets off a plane, we're led to believe that he's the famous general who is getting a fanfare played for him. But we find out that the staff is just rehearsing for the real thing. To prepare the band, Tom says this. Lloyd? Yes, sir. The band was fine that time. Just a bit brighter, huh? Yes, sir. You tell the second trombone and the third bar it's a B flat, not an A. I shall, sir. Thank you. Now here's the music that plays for the real general, Tom's boss, when his plane arrives. Does it sound to you like it's written in a different key?
The day after that reception, when we sort of hear my inamorata, we get that small bit of big, beautiful ball when Tom arrives at the U.S. Embassy in London. Again, it's light and fun and plays through the moment when Tom spots Tank in the embassy lobby. Tank's arrival prompts the 30-minute flashback in the film, and it takes place sometime during the Korean War in the 1950s. Tom and Tank are serving in the Air Force there as hotshot pilots, and they walk into a bar and go after the same girl. Tom gets to the pretty girl first, and to distract Tom, Tank tries to provoke a fight with the man by asking him to spit on a tiny American flag. This leads to those cliched bar fights in movies where two people fighting turns into everyone kicking and punching. So when they first walked into the bar, there was some source music played, and it's all composed by John Williams. It's the first of the three musical bits that I want to discuss. Let's listen to it first. The music is led by an electric guitar, and the melody is pretty cool. John Williams thought so too. When the original 1966 soundtrack was released, he extended this music to almost three minutes. Take a listen to the variation he made, substituting a saxophone for the guitar, even though the track is called Trumpet Discotheque. Once the fight gets underway, it's scored with John Philip Sousa's Stars and Stripes Forever, which is kind of fitting since the fight itself is about the American flag. A couple of times, the action on screen is even choreographed to the beat of the music. John Williams wrote a prelude to the fight that included a catchy melody, but that opening was removed from the finished film. Here is the prelude as it was originally intended, followed by a bit of Stars and Stripes Forever, that played during the film. If you sync up this music to Tank throwing the first punch, you'll see how well the prelude works with the whole scene if it's added into Stars and Stripes Forever.
The original theme for the scene that Williams wrote remained in the film, but only for about 25 seconds before returning to Sousa's composition. John Williams composed a longer variation on his fight music for the original soundtrack release in 1966. I like that Stars and Stripes Forever was used in the film, but I do wish the lead into it stayed in the final cut. Much later, when Tom tells Julie that Tank died in a plane crash, Tom has a fake memorial on the seashore. Williams has a bit of fun with this, using the organ as if it were a real funeral. So, the film returns to the present, and while Tom is in Denmark at a conference, Tank spends an evening with Julie. Julie has a fascination with owning two of everything, and she insinuates that could include having two men in her life. The two kiss, but Tank pulls back, realizing the game has changed now that Tom and Julie are married. Underneath this scene is a better rendition of the love theme than what played earlier in the film during the flashback. One other cue of notice comes when Julie goes to a movie theater in Rome where she and Tank are spending time while Tom is in Labrador freezing in an igloo. The lovers making out in the movie Julie is watching change and suddenly Julie sees her and Tank making out in the movie and speaking Italian. Tom enters the room in the movie and shoots the lovers in a jealous rage. All the while, John Williams writes something pretty cool.
since the climactic fight scene didn't get music, there wasn't much more music of significance in the film. Often, Williams would get a chance to open up the orchestra and play the main theme over a dialogue-free scene in any of his past films. But the love theme doesn't get that opportunity, and I came away from watching the film not impressed much with the score. Upon hearing it later away from the film, I have a better appreciation for the main love theme. So, that's it. Five films in one year, and if you put all five together, I give John Williams a solid B for his compositions. This is helped largely by the A-plus effort of How to Steal a Million, which helped lift the overall grade I'm giving. Despite the output, Williams was not nominated for any awards for 1966. That was the year Born Free picked up Oscars for its song and score, both composed by John Barry. Other top scores that year were Jerry Goldsmith's The Sand Pebbles and Elmer Bernstein's Hawaii. If any of the scores that John Williams wrote in 1966 warranted a bit of awards, awards attention, I would pick How to Steal a Million. I wonder if 20th Century Fox did any work to promote that score, or the movie, to those who vote for Hollywood Awards. The film itself got only one Guild nomination for its screenplay, while the inferior Not With My Wife You Don't got a Golden Globe nomination for Best Musical or Comedy Motion Picture. Go figure. In addition to the song Born Free, 1966 was a great year for movie songs. There was Alfie, from the film of the same name, and another song called Strangers in the Night from the forgettable film A Man Could Get Killed. Frank Sinatra made Strangers in the Night one of his big hits. So you could tell that none of the songs John Williams wrote in 1966 were going to get any noticed when compared to those I just mentioned. But as he was in his early 60s with writing music for films, John Williams was learning the ways of writing songs in the late 1960s, and though he would not rely on songwriting for many films, his ability to create lasting melodies for his lyricists would vastly improve. John Williams had a very productive year in 1966 as a freelance film composer, at a time when many of his peers were tied down to studio contracts. Though the work might not have been award-worthy, Hollywood was taking notice. When the calendar turned to 1967, John Williams was setting up for a year that, on the surface, was going to be like any other year. But when 1967 was over, he would find his career taking a new trajectory that he would continue to explore for many years. Thanks so much, everybody, to tuning into this episode of The Baton. I would love to know your thoughts on John Williams' output from 1966. And I might take the time to read your comments on a future show. So, please send me an email to jeffswim at aol.com or post a comment on the Podbean app. And if you've missed any previous shows, they are all available on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. I look forward to the next episode, and until then, the baton is down. <laughs>